My grandmother was nine years old when violence was about to break, break out because of the partition of British India. The province of Bengal was to be split into East and West, Muslim and Hindu. And it was considered to be unwise, suicidal even, to be trapped on the other side, on the wrong side. And my grandmother was decidedly trapped on the wrong side. Her parents were desperate to get her to safety, and so they approached their neighbor. Their neighbor was 16 or 17 years old, and he assured my great-grandparents that he would indeed bring their young daughter to safety by taking her to Calcutta in Hindu India. Being a Muslim, he knew that he was much le less likely to be targeted by the baying mobs. And he kept his promise, and he delivered my grandmother to safety in a refugee camp. A few weeks later, her two brothers, who had crossed over already, found her among a sea of faces in one of the many refugee camps. My own narrative, my own story, is much less likely to ever be a Bollywood story. In fact, it's never going to be a Bollywood movie. Um, I moved away from home when I was 17. I graduated. I moved to Toronto to go to U of T for law school. And, well, I, I never left. Here I am. My grandmother's experiences obviously had a very profound impact on my career choice. But even apart from that, as a small child, I loved watching travel shows. And I really enjoyed reading books set in other countries. And I'd always regretted not studying international relations in undergrad. But I, I found a way to resolve all my desires. And that was by becoming a refugee lawyer. And it really was the best way to learn about the world if, A, you're a masochist, <laughs> and B, if newspaper headlines aren't enough to convince you that this world is just a garbage place. It can just be terrible. <laughs> but that's a choice I made, and I'm very happy with it. And so I am. And uh, so my first year out of law school, I got the opportunity to represent a client uh, without my supervisor. So it was my first ever hearing, and I was excited and I was nervous. But it actually went really well, and I got a positive decision. So I was feeling very good about myself, and I walk out into the elevator with you know, a foolish grin plastered on my face. And I nod hello to the other person in the elevator. And she asked me if I was going on my lunch break. And I said, oh, no, no, I'm done for the day. She just kind of looked at me, and she said, you know interpreters are supposed to be here all day, right? <laughs> so I could go on and on. There's about five or six more stories that I have along the same lines, but I'll leave them for another time. The fact is I can package those stories neatly and use them as a punchline, and it doesn't really significantly affect my life in any way. It, it sucks, but it doesn't significantly affect me in any way. But my clients aren't so lucky. So in theory, the refugee process is meant to be non-adversarial. In most cases, there's no opposing counsel. Sometimes there is, but in most cases, um, it's just the decision maker, the refugee claimant, and the claimant's counsel. The decision maker is meant to be a neutral arbiter. The rules of evidence are extremely extremely relaxed, and the entire, um, the way it's structured is to be very, very informal and to take into account the trauma of refugee claimants, which is great, it's fantastic. Except in practice, things are a little bit different. In practice, a refugee claimant can be refused because, look, on a, on a balance of probabilities, you probably carved that swastika on your back yourself. Because are you, are you even sure you're gay? Have you had a boyfriend? No. Have you even had sex? No. Well, you're probably not gay. Actually, you know what? You're lying. You're definitely not gay. Or because, can you come a little bit closer? Can I look at your ears? Well, I'm looking at this 20-year-old passport picture. It's taken from a completely different angle. And it doesn't match the years I'm seeing right now. 
And you have all this evidence here, but clearly these years, they speak the truth. These cases aren't anomalies, and these are all real cases, these are all examples from real cases I've worked on. And just to be more clear, I've had a Roma client who was uh, very brutally attacked by neo-Nazis, and she was accused of carving swastikas on her back herself to gain sympathy. Uh, I have had another client who was a young Iranian homosexual man who was disbelieved for his lack of sexual experience. He was 18, by the way. And I've had a Tamil refugee seeker whose claim was extremely well documented, but he was disbelieved because his years didn't match. The underlying premise in all of these decisions is that people seeking to gain entry into Canada are liars. And it's very easy to blame a lack of compassion or conservatism or a misunderstanding of legal principles, but maybe it's something more. Maybe it's just impossible for someone who's been raised in a safe, stable environment to truly comprehend a civil war or the fear of being disappeared, or the vulnerability of trusting your life to a smuggler, or of putting your children in flimsy boats because maybe the water will be kinder than land. And so maybe some decision makers don't believe because some decision makers can't believe. And maybe it's just easier to call refugees liars than to truly comprehend what an abysmal place this world can be sometimes. There's also an inherent hubris in the assumption that people are so desperate to get into Canada that they'll invent all manner of horrible stories to come here. But what this ignores is that people have extremely deep, complicated, beautiful bonds to the homelands that they've left behind, to the family who couldn't make it with them, to the food, the comfort and the music of their native language, the fruit seller they haggled with every morning, or the neighbors who could never mind their own goddamn business. And so, I don't really have any solutions to any of this. All I know is that despite all of this, I'm still hopeful. Maybe I'm crazy, but I'm still hopeful. And I'm hopeful because we have, a, we have appeal processes, and. They're not perfect, they're very, very flawed, but they exist and they're functional. And I'm hopeful because there's so many people working relentlessly to make the systems kinder, more compassionate, less ridiculous. And I'm hopeful because I've been standing up here for about 10 minutes and no one has yelled ISIS at me. So thank you very much for that. About 60 years after she first made India her home, my grandmother took a special kind of pride in telling people that I was a refugee lawyer. You know, I was a refugee. I even had a refugee passport. I lived in a refugee camp. And she told me this every single time it came up, which was a lot, because that's my job. But I often wonder what happened to the neighbor. She never heard from him again, and her parents never heard from him again, and they didn't know if he ever survived the violence. But I wonder if he knew that his act of kindness would have ripple effects over generations. Because if it weren't for his profound selflessness, I wouldn't be standing here. I would never even have been a refugee lawyer in the first place. Thank you. <laughs>